Thanks, Kevin, and thanks for uh, the organisers for inviting me here. Um, OK, uh, the time is out of joint, O oh, cursed spike, that ever I was born to set it right. Name that quote. Hamlet? Yay, well done. Act one, scene five, uh, no prizes. Um, I'm going to talk about time. Um, I think to me, in understanding the lockdowns, particularly in terms of the stolen years, um, time is really key. And what I want to look at uh, particularly is how our collective willingness to stop the clock expressed a much longer problem in a, a present day society, uh, which is our collective difficulty in giving meaning to social and personal experience. My research area is uh, generations, sociology of generations, um, and I could explain what that means for a very long time, but I'm not going to because I've got 20 minutes. But essentially, when we're thinking about generations, uh, we acknowledge that people, on the one hand, are biological creatures. Okay, we, we get born, we age, as we know, and we die, and along the way we reproduce ourselves. These are you know, biological um, things that we do but we are also socially and culturally constructed. And what I mean by this um, is that that whole process of reproduction happens within a personal, social, and cultural context. We are not just animals in that respect. Um, we reproduce ourselves uh, within families and intimate relationships, and within the context of a wider society. We're educated and socialized by our elders. Uh, we form peer groups with people of our own age. So generation ba basically has a, a biological and a social meaning. The discussion of time, or temporality as it's often kind of referred to um, in, in this discussion, is a, is a central feature of social reproduction. Um, and when you look at the history of the discussion of generations, um, there's, a, there's a lot of discussion about the transition, for example, from pre-industrial time to industrial time that we've been through historically as, as societies. So in pre-industrial society, uh, we're basically organized around the natural rhythms of life. Um, and uh, with industrial society, we have a more conscious social organization of, for example, the working day. So, you know, the harvest becomes less of a kind of determining feature of our existence and everything, even though it's still important. Within the process of growing up, um, there's a well-acknowledged tension between what some people call family time and social time. Um, so, you know, as a child, you're kind of very much organised in your own way with your family and you have the rhythms of the family that capture uh, and give, give shape to your existence. But as you grow, um, you become socialised into a kind of social time. You go to school and those kind of structures and rhythms gradually become introduced and start to frame your experience and existence, and then you become a worker and a contribute to adult society. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, now, since the millennium, there's been um, much more of a focus on the consequences of globalisation and um, the kind of more fragmented risk society. Have you come across this concept, living in a risk society? Um, and what that's meant for the disorganisation of social time you know, as, um, you know, for example, working days you know, are in different time zones across the world. There's different expectations. Um, you know, the working week, as you'll know, is, you know, all the time. Um, people can work, you know, at any point over 24 hours and so on and so forth. And there's been a sort of disorganisation of the, the rhythms of kind of industrial time that, that um, existed for uh, much of the 20th century. And this has impacted on young people's life transitions. So there's also quite an interesting discussion about the shift that's happened from a, a so-called linear or standard biography. Um, you know, you kind of go to school and then you go to work and then you get married and then you have kids and you, know, you have a job and then you retire and then you die. You know, it's like the, the, like the game of life used to be in the 1970s. I don't know if anyone knows the old game of life. You followed a path and you picked up a couple of kids along the way and whatever. I don't think you quite died in the game of life because it's for children, but still, that was kind of where you were going. Um, and then you've had a shift to a more kind of contingent so-called risk biography, which is based on flexibility and uncertainty. Uh, so when I bought the game of life for my children several years ago, 
it was really weird and totally postmodern because you had all of these different places you could be and all of these choices you could make. And I thought, well, it's a really interesting metaphor for what's actually happened in terms of that shift from the linear biography to the risk biography. Um, so, you know, now the, 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 the kind of socialisation of young people is in a context uh, based on flexibility and uncertainty. And the key milestones of the 20th century have become more disorganised and individuated. Now, I'm just going to leave that there. I, I assume you know what I mean by that, but I'm happy to return to it in the discussion. There's been a sort of an attempt to compensate for this um, with um, arguably some increasingly rigid um, age structures brought into uh, childhood and teenagehood, largely through education and associated with rites of passage. So obviously you've got exams, you know, you've got GCSEs and A-levels, important milestones. School proms and things like that, which yeah, we didn't have when I was a kid, but have now become really, really important. The year six leaving thing from primary to secondary transition. Those of you who aren't from Britain, you might have different versions of this thing in your, in your country, but in your countries. But there has been this sort of attempt to sort of have this sort of, yeah, the, the, these kind of constructed rites of passage in education, but they don't really do the same thing as the implicit um, milestones that used to that feature as the kind of linear biography. Anyway, and that was uh, before the pandemic. That's been going on for at least 30 years. People have been talking about all of this. So, what happened during the lockdowns? Well, in essence, the, these fragile temporal scaffolds that I've just described were abruptly taken away, straight away, um, and you know, completely. Exams, proms, driving tests, year six leave assemblies, all of these things um, suddenly kind of disappeared. That was quite significant. Um, I mean, more significant was the context in which that happened, which is it happened in, in a, a context of the suspension of education in any meaningful sense. The closure of schools, the closure of universities. Um, I am so done with arguing about people about where schools actually closed. They really, really were. Um, you know, and so you, you had this kind of withdrawal of education for a very long period of time, at least a year, I would probably say two in a university context. Um, and that was symbolic of something much deeper, which was the withdrawal of adult society. Okay, the, the knowledge and continuity rooted in the generations of the past was suddenly taken away and everything was suspended to deal with a very present day emergency and you probably all remember that at that time you're living from day to day to day uh, with everything kind of organized around the, the here and now. Now this, this discombobulation of time has had a big impact on everybody. You'll all have heard people talking about memory holding. Uh, those of you with older relatives will be aware of the, the really discombobulating effect it's had on a lot of older people actually during that period. Um, so I'm not kind of saying that young people are particularly special in this regard. I think we all kind of struggled with what happened to time. But I do think that this, this, um, that, that discombobulation really strikes more deeply at young people because in your kind of late teens, early 20s, it's a really kind of formative period of your life. This is a period of life where you, you develop your orientation to the world, essentially. Um, you kind of move away from the childhood and you move towards adulthood and you're working out your own consciousness, your own sense of yourself and where you're situated uh, really for the first time. And you're doing that in a context where you already lack a certain amount of control and independence as well. So you don't have the same, well, often the same confidence, but just the same kind of practical ability to shrug off things that you don't agree with or to do your own thing because you're in that sort of liminal state between childhood and adulthood. And I think during lockdown, you had a <laughs> sense not just of um, the adults leaving the room, but they actually left the building. Um, you know, and it really contributed to that state of destabilisation that, that young people experienced during that time. I think this disorientation um, can go some way to helping explain a lot of the um, struggles that have been identified with young people during that period. It's not the full explanation because that, that would be too pat, but I think, for example, the rise in uh, mental health problems, um, the kinds of mental health problems, 
particularly the, the mental health problems that really rose during the pandemic and then went down again. You know, I think that that's a kind of an important backdrop to, um, uh, that, well, it really expresses kind of young people's kind of difficulty in, in dealing with that kind of abrupt lack of, of scaffolding. I think it also goes some way in describing the, I would say, continuing sense of desocialization um, amongst young people, a sort of sense that they don't really know how to behave in certain contexts, and you see it in you know, children in school um, and also you know, university students. Um, yeah, it's not like they're even being bad or anything, but there is this sort of sense of unfamiliarity with the conventions that, that used to exist. You know, like, I mean, yeah, students have often not turned up to lectures and seminars, but there used to be at least be an idea that they should. <laughs> and <laughs> that kind of thing that I'm describing. So it's a kind of weird state to be in, isn't it, now? You've gone, you know, we got back to normal, right? It's all normal. Um, but this kind of normal has um, an artificial and contingent quality, I would argue, where you get the sense that society is putting on a facade. You know, we, we know that nothing is as it was, right, before the pandemic. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I've kind of forgotten a lot of things about how things were before the pandemic. And obviously it's not like it was during the pandemic, but it's not really clear what it is now. And there's been no genuine attempt really to reckon with the experience of the lockdowns and the social meaning of that, other than kind of, yeah, rather performative government inquiries that are about everything, it seems, rather than the pandemic itself. And also linked to the fact there's been no genuine attempt to reckon with this, there's no future looking focus. We're all in this situation where we're constantly muddling through this sort of endless state of crisis, it seems. You know, it's a, we seem to be on emergency alert all the time, whether it's, you know, whether it's COVID, but then heat waves, I don't know if you remember last year, you know, it was like, so oh, heat wave, right, you know, stage one or stage four or whatever, it was red. Anyway, the big emergency, you know, climate change, which is a kind of a constant thing, but that's like we're constantly incited to say, well, this is an emergency, we must do something now. Um, strikes, all these things that are going on at the moment. And these are all really, really different phenomena. Okay, climate change is very, very different to a, a railway strike or a teacher strike or a doctor strike or whatever. But there's something about it that means it's kind of experienced in a similar way and we react to it in a similar way. It's like, oh God, here we go again. Why can't we ever just do something? Um, everything might be taken away. Um, and it gives the sense that the, 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 that the ability to plan our lives or work towards anything is some kind of like mirage or fallacy. All we can do is respond to events. I mean, and just as an aside, that's why I think the, uh, the recent um, academic strikes and the market marking boycott in universities was so unforgivable because you know, academics have got quite a lot to complain about. But it was almost like you know, you've got this, this cohort that has lived through the first two COVID years into their final year, and then suddenly it's like, right, we can take it away again. You know, and it just fuels that sense of sort of contingency and, and cynicism. Okay, so I think all of this kind of reveals that we've got a big problem for, um, in, in how we make meaning of, you know, our society today and how we endow social reproduction with a positive yeah, sense of... Excellent. I'm on track. Positive sense of purpose. You know, when we, when we think about reproducing ourselves, I mean, socially but also biologically, these two things are connected because we don't, you know, we do choose usually to have children rather than just have them. Um, I think, you know, just to go back to the point I made at the beginning, the idea that we needed to adapt to the uncertainties of a risk society was very prevalent pre-pandemic, but it was often given a positive gloss. Anyone familiar with Anthony Giddens? Okay. So, you see, that very fact shows, you know, that, you know, I mean, Giddens' stuff was very influential and largely quite positive about um, this, the, this thing. Yeah, the disorganisation of time and the disorganisation of social norms were presented often in terms of the virtues of flexibility, reflexiveness, plasticity, you know, all of these kind of new sociological bu buzzwords. And there would be lots of commentary all the time. Who wants a boring job for life? Who wants to work nine to five? We should kind of look again at the school day. It's so old fashioned. Don't you know teenagers aren't actually awake till 10 o'clock, etc. You know, and you'd have this whole kind of, you know, flexibility as a virtue. 
Now, I think we're becoming a bit more aware of the downsides um, because they were brought back, you know, brought home so clearly during the lockdown. With the individuation of time that we see now, obviously nothing gets done collectively. And there's also a sense that nothing matters as well. Um, so we have a weird situation where it's kind of simultaneously a breathless rush to do everything now. We must stop global warming tomorrow. We must you know, have every experience, every social experience all at once because we might not be able to do it, you know, because you never know if, if things are going to change. So you've got that going on, but you've also got this existence of sort of, I mean, I've put here, I don't know if it makes sense, but a sort of state of febrile lethargy where you kind of get a sort of frenetic but entirely purposeless activity, which is actually how I characterise the public sector right at the moment. Um, and this is all the product of a very presentist imagination. It reflects our estrangement from history, um, our estrangement from the ability to take the long view of where we are in things, and um, our estrangement from the people who embody that history, largely you know, embodied in the older generations. Um, Socialisation kind of now means that we're, we're taught to operate according to disembodied cultural or economic imperatives, rather than to try and make meaning in context. And this is why the suspension of education and the, cultural, the cur current cultural war on the family, why these two things are so important, because they really do represent a kind of, um, uh, a, you know, a kind of a reaction against those generational norms and meaning-making experiences that have held generations together um, over history. So I think reckoning with lockdowns, just to conclude, means grappling with how we give meaning to social time, which then also relates to how we confer meaning on personal activities and also our personal biographies, and recognising and acknowledging that these two things go together. Thank you.